According to martial arts legend, in 1566, a band of English traders turned for shelter to a Buddhist monastery at the foot of the Songshan Mountains in the Henan province of northern China. The name of the monastery was the Shaolin Temple. Inside the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas were the elite martial arts warriors of China, the soldier monks of Shaolin, engaged in a spectacle that was unlike anything these Westerners had seen before. But in the climate of dynastic intrigue and repression that characterized the dying days of the Ming Dynasty, the martial techniques under practice were a closely guarded secret. Questioned by the traders, their guide would offer only one explanation. Kung Fu, he said. They are training to master an art. The films of Bruce Lee and others brought Chinese Kung Fu to audiences of millions worldwide. Today, the term Kung Fu is synonymous with the traditional fighting arts of China, arts that many believe are the basis of all of the Asian fighting systems. When compared to Korean Taekwondo or Japanese Karate, for example, some of the differences are easily visible. Kung Fu is generally distinguished by more fluid movements, an emphasis on learning many weapons, and its colorful traditional dress. It is, some believe, the most beautiful of all the martial arts. But save for an initiated few, the true nature of Kung Fu remains a mystery. It began with one man, a Buddhist monk, the third son of a Brahmin Indian king. His name was Bodhidharma. In 527 AD, Bodhidharma went to China to the court of the Chinese Emperor Wu. Buddhism, he learned, had been tampered with. It was no longer just an internal mental act of devoting oneself to Buddha, but one that now took specified public acts of devotion. Rituals involving calligraphy, the adornment of shrines, and the building of tributes honoring Buddha. When the emperor asked for Bodhidharma's reaction to the great temples and shrines he constructed to honor Buddha, Bodhidharma replied, these are but as shadows of the forest. They are empty and have no substance. Bodhidharma would have to tackle the problem at its source, the legendary Shaolin Temple in northern China. There are two schools of thought on what happened after Bodhidharma left the emperor's court. One is that he went to the Shaolin Temple and he found them so secularized, so worried about money and worldly things that he left them in disgust. He refused to teach them his special muscle changes philosophy, which blends mind and body harmony in the martial arts that we know today. He goes off to a cave, he stares at a wall for nine years. The second school of thought is that instead of going to the shouting temple first, he just went to the cave, stayed there for nine years meditating while disciples came seeking attention until he found a disciple worthy of the information he had to impart. In the 10th year, in a bid to become his first disciple, a monk severed his left arm. His act was the first evidence that Bodhidharma's message had been understood. What mattered was not the external, but the internal. Bodhidharma rose to the side of his first disciple, 
in whose honor the Shaolin monks would from then on salute Buddha with only one hand. It was time for the teachings to begin. Bodhidharma was a proponent of the concept of chi, the vital energy or essence or life force that we all hold within us. This is a primary concept that's held within the Chan Buddhistic school of thought, or Zen Buddhism as we know it in the West. This chi, or vital essence, could be focused within, taking that inner focus and developing it through mental, spiritual, and physical discipline, which we know as the martial arts. You could aim that energy toward parts of your body. He called this linking energy. And then he could explode that energy into a part of his body for healing purposes, perhaps. That would be called exploding energy. This interworking with the chi is a very important part of all Chinese martial arts and the essence of the peaceful interdisciplinary aspect of martial arts worldwide. Through Bodhidharma at Shaolin, the theory was it would be possible to maximize external physical strength by maximizing internal strength, the flow of the chi. For the monks of Shaolin, this meant one thing, survival. Throughout the temple's history, the monks had faced what appeared to be an irreconcilable conflict. They had to defend themselves against the threats posed by constantly shifting political alliances, while at the same time preserving the spiritual harmony that defined a life dedicated to Buddha. If Bodhidharma's beliefs and teachings about Qi were accurate, the monk's ability to worship was also the basis of their ability to ward off aggressors. That was the theory. The question was, would Bodhidharma's theory work? In medicine, the existence of this unifying force, or Qi, has long formed a very basis for the practice of acupuncture. In 652 AD, Sun Xu Mao found that Qi flowed along precise meridians between the body's organs. Using tiny electrical charges generated by acupuncture stimulation, he could affect this energy field and redress imbalances, remove blockages, and ultimately heal patients. For contemporary Kung Fu practitioners, the existence of Qi has never been under question. When properly focused, this is the energy that enables them to transcend the physical limitations of flesh and blood and perform feats that appear to challenge the impossible. In the 20th century, the advent of electromagnetic imaging technologies enabled Chinese scientists to gather proof of Qi's existence. The monks of the 6th century Shaolin Temple, though, could not turn to science. They had to put Bodhidharma's theory to the test. To maximize Qi, they meditated. To maximize linking energy, they practiced a form which became known as the Lohan, a series of 18 unique movements that, when combined with the right breathing technique, refined mind-body coordination. To develop explosive energy, they followed a training regimen of unparalleled severity, a regimen with one objective, to create a warrior whose resolve no aggressor could disturb. The tests of the Shaolin were no less extreme. The final test, given before a monk was allowed to become an emissary of the temple, was known formally as the Hall of the Wooden Men, to the monks as the Corridor of Death. It was a test in which monks who lacked the capacity to defend themselves and their temple died an often painful death. 
The test consisted of a long corridor lined with 108 mechanical dummies primed to randomly release weapons with deadly precision and force. Blocking the exit sat a burning 300-pound cauldron. For those who reached the cauldron, the reward was the intense pain of burning flesh and the indelible brands of the Shaolin. A tiger on one arm and a dragon on the other. To survive was a victory of the chief.